Good evening, everyone. Um, hello, and welcome to Foils. Tonight, we welcome internationally renowned street artist Stick and world music pioneer and organizational guru, Sheila Chandra. A decade ago, I was painting street art illegally in the streets of Hackney and had a small cult following of collectors from the few small exhibitions I had on, I'd put on. I was squatting and occasionally being sleeping rough, making my way and living off my wits. It was during this period that I randomly met influential singer Sheila Chandra at a cabaret night where I happened to be working. Sheila had entered the UK music charts back in the 1980s when she was only 16 as an Asian fusion pioneer and helped to establish the world music genre with 10 studio albums to her name, three of which were on Peter Gabriel's real world label. So she knows a thing or two about emerging art forms, which is what the UK street art market was at the time. I felt a little intimidated by her accomplishments as an artist and she occasionally found my world a bit wild and chaotic, but she treated me as an equal, and we became close friends. Sheila had been working since she was a kid and never really had a teenage, uh, so I became her wingman at clubs. And she, in return, helped me to create the career of my dreams. As well as painting in the streets, I was also an actor, I made fashion accessories and occasionally worked as a go-go to hunt a true story. <laughs> <laughs> she told me to choose one and ditch the others. It felt harsh, but I took the challenge and chose painting. That first step allowed me to focus without distraction. My career accelerated immediately. Over the next few years, Sheila gave me the tools to, to organize myself and help me put the systems in place to handle opportunities when they came. Her unique insight into the organizational needs of, specifically of creative people, was hard won, and I had the privilege of her personal guidance through the minefield of the art world. Anyone who works in the art world knows that it is. Um, she drafted my first contract, was at my back when I fought my battles, and helped me get back on my feet over and over again. She was my guardian angel, my secret weapon, and my best friend. Sheila had for some years been suffering from a rare progressive condition called burnt mouth syndrome. That meant talking caused her acute physical pain a cruel irony for someone with such a wonderful voice. And knowing, and knowing she would not always be able to talk me through things, in 2011, Sheila wrote a guidebook for me, outlining all the things I would need to know to make it as an artist. This became my Bible. As my career progressed, she talked through her pain. She was my samurai master and trained me hard and made Hard to, to make it in the battlefield that is the art market. And by 2015, I was flying the world over with sold-out shows and monumental murals in America, Asia, and Europe. By then, Sheila's vocal pain meant that she was unable to talk for any length of time. But her systems were as relevant as ever, and I would not have been able to handle the success if she had not drilled these systems into me. She showed me how to keep myself sharp and defend my art like a tiger. I would not be here today as an artist if it were not for Sheila. Sheila's system gave me the structure I needed to protect and cultivate my creative spirit. It took care of my practical needs and gave me the space and the time to let my creative spirit play, to dance with chaos 
rather than being devoured by it. We are fed the myth that organisation is, un is unartistic and that the art just happens spontaneously. I've seen so many wonderful artists fall victim to the many parasitic and predatory entities that inhabit the murky waters of the art market. Ironically fearing that even thinking about organising themselves would evaporate their creative spirit when in fact it's exactly the thing that will set them free. It's sometimes maddening to go back and forth between my office and my studio inhabiting two different worlds but they are inseparable and each is as important as the other. Well, sort of, kind of. <laughs> Having mastery of my office I have found my creativity spreading beyond the edge of the canvas and into my organisation, allowing me to creatively engage with other organisations and charities, bringing out a paradigm shift in the scale and reach of my creativity. I persuaded Sheila, I, I nagged her for two years, to expand this book to become organising for creative people and for her to offer a mentoring service, a mentoring service so that other artists could benefit from the same lessons that I have had. If you have a good manager or patron and you're happily surrendered to your creative chaos, then good for you. But if you are serious about making it in the art world, read this book and listen to Sheila because she knows a thing or two. Um, so housekeeping first, toilets are that way. Um, I don't mind you, you know, I don't want you to sit there needing to go, just <laughs> go. And um, I must also thank Foils, um, everyone at Foils who's uh, helped to arrange this. Um, it's really lovely to get to meet my audience for this book because that's not something I've done before. This is the first talk I've done uh, on this book. Um, as Stick mentioned, I do have limited voice time. Um, if I didn't use my voice at all, then my vocal muscles would atrophy. So um, I do talk some of the time, but it's very much like having a bad pay-as-you-go mobile. And uh, <laughs> I talk, you know, because the pain carries on. Um, I need a pop shield, really, don't I, Adrian? Um, the pain carries on uh, after I've spoken for hours or days or whatever. So um, uh, it's a good opportunity to gather you all here and speak to you all. And hopefully also we're co recording this. Um, uh, if anyone who asks a question doesn't want to be included on the recording, which will probably be broadcast as a podcast and on YouTube, uh, just free on YouTube, then... Um, do come and let me know, write your name down on a card and uh, let me know what question you asked and we can always edit you out. Um, but it'd be nice to make that resource available for everybody. Um, and that's a way of making my voice go further, obviously. Um, so, uh, I'm not assuming that all of you have had a chance to look through the book. I see some people do have copies. Um, but I, what I thought I'd do is run through... Uh, uh, some of the areas that it covers and the kind of logic of how it's set out, which would kind of maybe prompt some questions from you as to what your problem areas are. You don't have to ask questions that are within the scope of the book. I will try and, if I can, answer questions without, outside that scope, but um, I know it's useful sometimes to have a prompt um, as to, you know, think, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, I do have a problem with that, or I could do with a bit of help with this. Okay, so the book starts with um, this whole question of the myth in your head, because the chances are, even if you're fairly organized, you have inherited this um, creative, dysfunctional genius trope. And um, I blame that on Van Gogh and Byron, personally. Um, you know, maybe they had very good at housekeeping behind the scenes and nobody um, found out about it. Um, but <laughs> they... Um, it's become, particularly in films and books, a kind of shorthand for genius. Because the trouble with genius is sitting down and waiting 
around the material that you're working with for that great idea to come is not something that's easy to portray, either visually or even in a novel. Um, and so it's become a very lazy stereotype. And I think the trouble is if you don't come from an artistic family or if you don't mix with a lot of artists and you don't know about the realities of working life as an artist, then you can unconsciously go into an artistic career believing that um, the mark of true creativity is chaos. And there has to be a spark of chaos, but it's rather like a snow globe that you, you know, you have to be in control of when you shake it. It has to be contained. And you know, it, ha it has to be something that informs your work rather than devours it, as, as Dick so eloquently said. Um, so the first chapter and the, and the, uh, and the uh, introduction go through that trope and, tr and try and get you past some of the, the myths around the, the resistances you have to giving up that myth. Because we have to, the book aims to start clearing things up in your life right from the foundation. And what's in your head is the very beginning of that. So once we've got rid of the myths, then it moves on to workspaces. Now I think an artist's workspace should work around them like an exoskeleton. A good singer, if she wants to reach a note, specific note, she just sit, thinks the note and it's there. That's how well your studio space, in whatever form it is, should function around you. You don't want an interruption between the idea and getting it down. Um, I tell a story in the book about how um, I used to keep handheld cassettes um, queued up all around my workspace, when I, all around my house actually, when I was writing an album. And I once came up with an idea on one of them that was the inspiration for three albums. And I know for a fact if I'd waited three minutes, that idea would have been gone. So, you know, that's how disciplined you have to be. Then we move on to a surprising chapter because it's um, on living spaces. And it's surprising because business tends to separate work life and home life. That isn't going to do you any favors as an artist. You are not a member of the Borg collective that's going to regenerate. You can't hire another artist to do your work the way a factory boss can hire another worker. So therefore, your peace of mind, your health, your energy levels, your ability to rest, all these are resources that become part of uh, your creative energy to take into the studio. So there is this, I know it sounds like you've stumbled into an issue of Good Housekeeping magazine, but you... This, this particular chapter is extremely <laughs> important. Um, and it, you know, it's also a kind of political point because economists have, um, to the detriment mostly of women, actually separated home life and uh, work life and not taken account of all the emotional labor that happens in the home and indeed the emotional labor that happens at work. And as artists, in a way, what we're about is emotional labor. Without that emotional labor, um, our work isn't going to be any good. Um, then we get to the home office, the artist's home office. Um, if your art is the body of your career, your desk is the brain. A lot of people are going to be counting on you not having a brain for your career, because then they can sweep in and get a very nice percentage off you, thanks very much. So, being organized right from the ground up, including where to place things so that you know you want to sit down at your desk, is important for when we get to the strategy stuff later on. If you don't have your desk sorted out, there's no point in you coming up with five-year goals because you're not going to have the system in place to achieve them. Um, that's the physical spaces section. Then there's a section of the book which I call headspace which is probably what all the established artists bought the book for, and then found themselves wading through physical stuff. Um, so, just a little memory prompt here. Okay, so then there's a chapter on um, well-being and creativity, how to balance uh, if you have to uh, do part-time work, if, or if you uh, are a parent or a carer, how to balance that with a creative career, um, how to um, 
set up routines and habits in your studios that will studio that will save you time, help you be more efficient, take the stress out of things, just ways of working which if you're not around other artists a lot will take you years to come up with and you know I don't want you to have to take years to do that. Um, those are all set out in, in lists so if your particular problem is that you stress a lot there's a list of you know about eight tips about how to take the stress out of the process. If it's that you want to be more efficient, there's a list for that. So you, you just go to the list that you want, but hopefully you work your way through all of them. Um, the next chapter is about career strategy. And this is very important from the point of view of motivation. If you don't know where you're going, then you don't know why you're doing the difficult stuff. You're not gonna get up and make that difficult phone call. If you can see what get, making that difficult phone call is going to get you, then you'll make it. And you'll make it first thing in the morning and then you'll get on with the other important stuff instead of spending the whole day avoiding it. Um, so you, one can't always be in charge of the direction one's career makes already, obviously. It depends on the zeitgeist of the time, it depends on your art form, it depends on, um, you know, uh, what your level of technique is, whether you're in the right place at the right time, all that sort of stuff. But at least having some sort of map, making contacts in the right sorts of areas, having some sort of strategy, diversifying so that you even out the ebb and flow of your um, earnings, all that stuff is important. So that's a kind of um, part two of the brain, part of your career. The next chapter is on self-promotion, so it covers social media and uh, press, TV, interviews, all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm sure the social media stuff is, I mean, it's a basic introduction. Um, and as with all the chapters in the Headspace section, there are more specialist guides for all these subjects out there. The trouble is that they're all written by experts in, say, law or social media or what have you. You pick it up and you think, oh my God. Because what they've done is cover their backs by covering every single eventuality that you will ever, ever face. Well, that is too confusing for a time-strapped artist to take in. So this is a beginning. This is get the basic right. This is all the basic essential infrastructure. It's a doing book. You do it as you go and then yeah, sure, go and get yourself a reference library of specialist guides, you know, that will suit your particular art form, because I don't pretend to cover every industry, and I haven't been able to be specific about, you know, I don't know, musician royalties or what have you, because that wouldn't be appropriate. The book would be ten volumes long. Um, next chapter is teams, support, and collaboration. So that covers things like the kinds of personnel you might need in your team, when, why, how you should search for that person, how and when you should hire staff, things to watch out for. Collaborations, how to know when to collaborate with someone, how to know what the terms to set uh, should be. Um, what do you do when people come and ask you for lots of freebies? That is a big issue. Um, how to know when to say yes to a freebie and when to say no. Um, yeah, sort of stuff like that. Also about personal relationships because you're going to need emotional support. You know, the thing is that people lack imagination. I think unless Stick had talked about it, people find it very hard to visualize how he was when I met him. I mean, he, he wasn't Stick then. He was Stick, of course, but he wasn't Stick as people know him now. And um, that... Uh, lack of imagination means that uh, if people see your brand, which is what they're supposed to do in a way, it's your shop window, it's what you put out there for everybody to see on social media and on your album covers or your book covers or, or whatever, or your, or your web pages, um, you know, there's always going to be the personal private you behind that that needs emotional support. That in a way needs support because other people are putting the weight of their glamorous expectation on you. Um, the next one is uh, managing paperwork for creatives. So popular, this chapter. And, uh, <laughs> no, but it has to be done, doesn't it? How to, how to streamline your paperwork, how to um, uh, make yourself more efficient around 
paperwork, repetitive paperwork like... There will be admin. There's always admin, isn't there? There will be admin. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so how to sort of streamline that, um, how to make things easier, how to sort of cut down on legal fees, how to make sure you're not drafting the same thing again and again and again. Um, how to um, manage your legacy, because if you have copyrighted works that have some kind of life and attention during your lifetime, they're going to live for 70 years after you die, as cu current copyright law stands. So someone is going to have to manage them. So what instructions do you leave for them? Um, how do you set that up and what is advisable? And um, I'm copyright trustee to my ex-husband's um, estate and he didn't leave any preparation. <laughs> so I know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> A little bit of personal agenda there with that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Then the last chapter is uh, maintenance and troubleshooting. So in the longer term, you know, let's face it, you're going to get ill. No one's going to believe that you're ill because, hey, you're magic, aren't you? You're a creative person. You can juggle chainsaws. Surely you're not human. You are going to get ill and people are going to be very, very annoyed that you're ill because mm, that's not what they think. Um, so you have to cut to kind of out how to know when to not, not to work, how to protect yourself. Um, what to do if you're suffering from stress, what to do if you are a chronic over a workaholic, um, what to do if you have creative block, uh, what to do if a project dies, which for legal reasons sometimes it does. You know, you have an amazing project you're so fired up about and then the lawyers say, no, sorry, you can't do this, and you're like, ah. So um, all those things. And um, then a, a final word of congratulations, which encourages you to scribble in the margins of the book which um, I'm sure foils wouldn't tell you to do, but yeah. We've left lots of space so you can do that. So there it is. Um, that's the scope of this book. Uh, Mahara from the art department just asked me what my next book was going to be. <laughs> they always do that. I'm like, oh my God, I've just written this one. Um, and I was thinking um, something, because the word, you know, it's soft. The word creativity has really been hijacked by soft business and all the books with creativity as a word in the title are all about how to be a creative executive or something or accountant or something. Um, and she was saying actually there is a bit of a gap for kind of hard creativity book for, for like serious creative people, artists and so on. So I'm toying with that at the moment but if anybody's got any ideas um, of a gap that they think needs to be plugged then... Um, do let me know, and I'm going to shut up now, and uh, which will be a welcome break for me. And um, but I'm going to keep the mic and um, throw it open to the floor. And um, what I'm hoping will happen is that some brave souls among you will, because um, we have a handheld mic that we passed around, that you will. Um, I didn't want this to be, you know, an hour of me talking to you, because you know I could witter on about stuff that's got nothing to do with what you're interested in or you may know it all anyway. So um, the best bit I always think is helping people solve their problems. So if you've got uh, a problem in the area of your creative career, then um, you know it could be emotional, it could be administrative, it could be uh, a creative process problem, then I'm hoping some brave souls will um, ask me the question and then Stick and I will give you our take on it. We did talk about being good cop, bad cop, but I think we're not going to do that. We're going we're to be nice to you. Um, so uh, I'm going to throw it open to the floor. Please put your hands up if you have a question. Uh, hi, yes. Uh, you've probably answered this in your book, which I've not read yet, but um, uh, you talked earlier, uh, both of you talked about uh, a kind of anti polymathery that you should focus on one art form uh, that you're good at and 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 ditch the others um, how do you choose if you have one that for example is very popular but you don't quite love it as much as another one that you love but people aren't picking up on that one mm. that, that's a difficult dilemma um, I suppose it depends on what kind of artist you want to be I mean there are people who 
will say, um, find a gap and fill it. That's coming in from the more sort of business end. And if you've got a market that's working for you there, that may be, if, I mean, if you need to work, earn a living, if you need to go full time in the next year or two, then that may be the thing to choose. Um, I think though that um, if you're making fine art, you're in it for the long haul. And what comes out of, it may take years to refine, but what comes out of your soul, uh, is only going to happen. That's only going to happen when you are leaping out of bed, needing to work at the art form you love. Um, so, and, and I also think you know it depends what you're doing. If if you're uh, if you're a maker who's making hats, for instance, and your other art form is a similar sort of you know similar sort of thing, where you know it, where it's more about finding a market, then maybe that's the way to go. But um, if it were me, I'd go for the thing that uh, I'm not. I'm not going to give you as an official piece of advice because I don't want you to sue me now. Um, but if it were me, what I would do is go for the thing that ignited my soul. Does that is that a, a good enough answer? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Okay. She, Sheila told me choose the one that you're most likely to make a living. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Did you? Time. I thought you did. Sorry, I take that back. <laughs> she didn't. Um, I would just say all of my uh, previous art forms that I've been involved in have come back in some way, with the possible exception of go-go dancing. <laughs> They've all come back into my um, under my stick persona at some point, and and I've got various plans for things in the future that. Um, where I am branching out into different areas, but all under the umbrella of this central theme. But um, certainly the painting was the thing that seemed to ignite me and get me up. It didn't get me up in the morning, it got me up in the middle of the night to go out and paint graffiti. <laughs> but that was... Um, yeah, but I mean, you, you being a maker, for instance, now that you've branched out into sculpture, then that's where it comes in. So, mm. you know, it's that working with your hands thing, it, it, all comes, it can all feed back in. The reason why, I know it's very difficult for, for people who are multi-talented, but the reason I recommend that is because of branding. Because people have to have, you know, you're in a very crowded marketplace, and with everything from how journalists describe you in one pithy phrase, to, um, uh, you know, what the woman in the shop who sells your work remembers you for. It's got to be a single distinctive thing. It's got to be a USP, a unique selling point, something that no one else does. If you do a dozen great things, you, unfortunately you're forgettable because they're not going to remember the whole list. The other problem is that if you work in several unrelated d disciplines, you're going to be trying to market yourself to several unrelated bunches of journalists you're going to have to get several bunches of unrelated uh, pieces of equipment to do your work. You're going to be spreading yourself far too thin. Each of your careers will, in effect, only be part-time. Mm. So, yeah, if you're Joni Mitchell, fine. Paint, do whatever you want. But, um, you know, Joni Mitchell didn't become famous for painting. She became I famous for... That. what? Yeah, yeah. Right. Point, uh, point, point, point proven. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, uh, people... It, 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 you need an arrowhead to get through. And that arrowhead is the focus of your brand. So that's why it's, it's difficult. But yeah, I mean, involve other stuff later. But, but get through your first stage of becoming known with one thing, I would suggest. There's a certain amount of humility as well about just admitting that you can't do everything. Like, I think about when somebody's agonizing over whether they're going to be a, a dancer, a singer, or a, a painter, or I mean, they just want to do everything, they think they can do everything. I'm like, do you know how hard this is just to do one? How arrogant are you that you think you can do everything? Like, you know, but, uh, yeah, there's a certain humility. And, and then what we're talking about here is being a, not a commercial artist, but a, an artist who is involved in commerce, and there is a big difference. You know, I'm not saying you have to sell out, but or make commercial work. Um, but you know, you are hoping to make a living. Um, if, if you're hoping to make a living, then um, you have to concentrate on one thing because, you know, as we've already said, half your time is going to be administration as well. So that already cuts your time down. Um, if you just want to be creative and you've got a private income and you just want to sing and dance all day and, you know, make ceramics on the weekends and, yeah, fine, great, fantastic. <laughs> 
But that's not what we're talking about. Another question? Hi, Sheila. Um, I was going to say, with regard to your next book, I think it'd be great if you wrote an autobiography because you've had such a unique career. Um, I'm, I'm somebody who'd really like to read about that in much more detail. Anyway, I'm going to come to my question now. Um, uh, I'm somebody that's moved through Clubland um, as a DJ and as a promoter for about 30 years. Um, and um, at the moment, my main passion is uh, the radio show that I present um, and uh, it's a show in which I think we provide a platform for many many um, music artists that are not represented in the mainstream um, but say for the last six years since the programme's not been at the BBC um, effectively I've been funding that show myself um, and I'm always in this dilemma as to uh, how to get over the, those awful words which are funding application. The minute anyone says funding application to me, there's a little switch that goes and doesn't want to have to deal with it. Um, and then that's when I call upon uh, friends like Chetna, who's in front of me here, um, to see if she can fill in the funding application forms instead. Um, but I was just sort of thinking about what you said earlier um, about having a strategy. And if you have a strategy, then that means you have to do it because you've got very clear targets and goals and I think I'm somebody that's kind of gone through my career without strategy. I've, I've allowed things to just land where they land and fortunately most of them have landed in some very interesting places. But Well I mean there's a great deal of a great deal to be said for being a good opportunist, you know, of making the most of, is a killer skill that I think Stick's very good at, um, for instance, of taking an opportunity and making it bigger. You know, someone says, uh, can you come and do a school mural? Um, well, you can expand that to maybe lecture it or teaching the children and getting the local press around photographing you doing that and, you know, suddenly it becomes a bigger thing. So that's a, a killer skill and I, 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 I've known you a long time, Rita. I know you're, you're great at all that stuff. Um, actually, it's a point of slight embarrassment because I realised a couple of days ago that I hadn't actually covered proposal writing in the book. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a silly omission. Um, the it, thing about it might have to be, have to be a postscript. It will. <laughs> the next edition, perhaps, we'll we'll put in a little section about that. But um, the key with funding applications is to get to their secret agenda. Now, if you've got guidelines, if they've given you a big, I know they look very intimidating, but actually they're your best friend. If they've given you a set of guidelines as to how your proposal should be set out and how long it should be and how many pages and what it should contain in sections and all that, that's brilliant because in there somewhere, they will have made a little slip, a little admission of what they actually want. For instance, they may say, um, uh, we're, um, we're, we're, um, we'd like to commission an artist because we'd like to draw attention to such and such issue. Uh, this is maybe a charity that says we'd like to draw attention to such and such um, issue and we'd like to sell the artwork which will raise money. So that's their stated intention. Actually what they may want is shed loads of publicity. So if you're an artist who's got a big social media platform, a big media platform and you can come in and say look I've been featured on all these shows um, I will send out a press release to all my contacts, I will get this amount of press and media attention, um, then, you know, in a way, if, if, you're being, if you're in the running with another artist who's got a very good proposal, that's probably what will tip it for you. So, um, people will say they want one thing and usually there's another agenda underneath. It's just human nature. Uh, and the key with the funding application is to find out what their agenda is and fill everything in with that in mind. Because that's what's going to tip it for you. Uh, but you know, hire yourself a copywriter. That's what copywriters are for if you hate funding applications. Delegate if words are not your thing, if those kinds of words are not your thing. Um, then get someone to do it. Because effectively you're writing an advert and that's what copywriters do. So that's what I would say with that, that specific problem. And yeah, a five-year plan might help. It might, might help you pick up the phone and find a copywriter. I mean, I suspect there's probably other people in the room that have this same mental block that I do. It's that thing of 
well, sorry, I'm an artist. I don't do that. I don't do funding application yeah. forms. No, yeah. and stick. You, you can you can re I've never relate written, to that. I've never written a funding application in my entire career. But you have done proposals for other people to get funding and commission like, proposals as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and then in a way, that's a funding application. Yeah, it is. You're right. <laughs> I just thought it'd be more rock and roll if I said it like that. <laughs> If you get any lippy, I'll, I'll tell you to take your glasses off and then you'll be in real trouble. <laughs> Do you want a jelly bean? <laughs> Thank you. Um, the pink ones are good. We try to get foils to remove all the blue ones, but I mean, they're just not rock and roll enough to do it. So, um, does that help, Riti? Brilliant. Let's catch up afterwards. And does anyone else have a question? Um, so just following up on what you said previously about how you um, accidentally admitted um, proposal writing from your book, are there any like other like teeny tiny tidbits that you wish you'd put in the book or that you're saving for like future like books, like perhaps a sequel to the current one? Um, I have um, a new author website called SheilaChandraBooks.com. So if I've forgotten anything, I will probably blog about it. I have to say, I finished the book well over a year ago, and there's nothing else that's come up. Um, that's why it's so embarrassing about the proposal thing. But um, especially as I helped you with some of your proposals, didn't I? With my so, what? Some of your proposals. Yeah, you did, didn't you? <laughs> um, no, there's, there's, there, I don't think that. No, I'm not. I don't hold things back. I, I, the reason it's embarrassing is I intended it to be a complete guide, complete in and of itself. So, um, I wish it was in there, and I'll try and make sure it's in a, in a, in a the next edition that it gets revised. Well, she is a resource as well. That she she provides a mentoring service. So, if there's anything that you want to find out, you she, she yeah. Sure I've left it. my contact cards on the signing table. So if you'd like to um, email me about the mentoring service or anything else. And the, um, the author website address is on there as well. So do go and take a card if you'd like. It's worth it. <laughs> Anyone else? Hello. Hello. I think you know me. Um, this is a personal question in so far as, so I work part time and the other half of my time I'm a screenwriter who's aspiring. So um, my question is how, like what would be your advice balance wise, because obviously I spend most of my time working because I need to earn money, feed my child, but here in the back of my head I'm like that's really what I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. So I spend as much time. but organizing my time in order to, to kind of give that enough time is very difficult so what would your suggestion be well you that? you maybe have done this already uh, because it sounds as though you're very mo motivated um, but if you find it hard to um, in physical terms work out what the balance should be I recommend keeping a time diary not of how you expect to spend your time, but how you actually have spent your time. A bit like an eating diary, you know, where you, where you, you note down what you actually have eaten, as opposed to what says on your diet sheet. So, you know, what you will probably find is that you're, you're thinking and you're on your feet and you're working strenuously for far longer hours than you think you are. Um, and that will give you a, a realistic, um, way of appraising how much time you have to put into the creative stuff. Um, but it may also give you clues as to where you can carve out pockets of time. So, um, you know, if it's possible to get someone else to watch your child for a couple of hours on a Saturday morning, or um, if it's possible to work after they're in bed at night, so you kind of save your mental time so that you're ready to do that. Um, if it's possible to plan you know, a plot line on your commute, um, you'll, you'll have to be very um, disciplined about using those pockets of time. And it, sometimes it is very useful to, to actually write down what they are and to plan your work for that particular commute or that particular block of, of a couple of hours. 
I find that it's not really possible to warm up the creative brain in anything less than an hour. So if I work for half an hour, I'm not really going to get anything great done. An hour or an hour or two, yeah, I probably am. And I wouldn't feel too bad about it because, you know, the brain gets tired. And if you're working in good, solid two-hour chunks, you're probably getting yourself at your creative freshest. You don't necessarily have to be physically fresh to be creatively fresh. Um, I used to find annoyingly that some of my best ideas would come at 10 o'clock at night when I really wanted to go to bed. But, you know, that's when the ideas were popping. So, um, and the other thing I would say is patience. You know, you're not going to have written a novel by Wednesday. Um, kind of be patient with yourself and give your plan a longer time frame to achieve your aims. I would also say that strategy stuff is important. So you know, you know exactly where you're going and you, you do that. You make your creative machine a lean one. You know exactly what you're aiming at. And you don't kind of noodle around on various projects that aren't going to get you where you want to go. But it is difficult. It is very difficult. And it's a situation that a lot of creative people find themselves in as the arts are being sort of devalued and underpaid. It's a situation that, that um, increasingly we're all in. And um, um, that doesn't mean that uh, people haven't produced some amazing works part time. You know, because they, they have composers, I can think of, you know, uh, who worked as professors at conservatories and are still writing amazing symphonies and stuff. So, um, yeah, I would just say be aware of that pacing. Another question? I used to do a lot of cycling photography, and it's like everyone wants everything for free <laughs> and just think that a credit is going to make you happy, you know? And, and I had to stop. I, I, I sort of fell into that trap because they make you feel like you're going to get something out of it at the end of it. And so you're, you know, forever giving away things for free. And then you realise you have to stop. But then there's another person come along that's giving away for things for free, falling into that same trap, right? And it doesn't only happen with uh, cycling photography, it happens with a lot of photography. People just seem to think you just turn up somewhere, take a photo and say, woohoo, you know, that was lucky. And, and you've got a magic photo, even with, um, say, like, uh, like art blog websites, things like that. And all these blog websites, everyone wants everything for free. And so there is like, a really restricted amount of work you can get as a photographer almost to put you to the point of like giving up like I did with cycling photography just had to give up because if you wasn't part of an organization or a paper or something else it didn't matter how good your photos were they weren't going to get anywhere you know and I think I'm the best photographer in the world like completely underrated and getting 12 likes on Instagram is like you know geez you're joking you know, when there's other people and they're complete rubbish, you know? <laughs> and, they get in, and they get thousands and thousands, you know? And so it can be a little bit disheartening. And also, like, how do you do that? The same sort of thing with having the job, you know? You can't, you know, do you, do you have to sort of reach uh, rock bottom before you can sort of come back up again? I think with the free stuff, there are two issues going on. That, that there are... On an individual level, getting asked to do, do a job for free um, and then there's the basic medium of your artwork being en masse made free and that is what you're talking about with photography and to some degree it's what's happened with music and music is so absolutely cut price now. I mean if, if, music, if CDs or if 10 tracks uh, if we charge the same as we did for 10 tracks as we did in 1992 with CDs, then as you know, 10 tracks would cost 30, 35 pounds. And the proportion of what went to artists would be a lot higher. So um, I do sympathize. Um, I don't have an industry specific answer to what's happening on an industry wide level like photography. What I talk about with free stuff in the book is how to work out how much gold there is in the big pile of manure. So, you know, there's a, with most free jobs, well, with a good free job, there'll be gold, there'll be a nugget of gold. The question is how big is it and how sticky is the manure? And that's, 
that's, only, that's something you have to weigh up on a case-by-case -case basis. When you've got an industry-wide problem, like uh, free um, photographic files, free JPEGs, then um, I think that's time for strategy. It's time for looking at what are you so good at that nobody else can do, that you can charge for it, and you can persuade people to pay you. So, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a strategy problem. Um, but I'm not putting it all on you because I think it is uh, a, a general arts-wide problem of people expecting everything for free. And as you say, people just thinking you just rock up and click and, and hey, that's an amazing picture. They don't understand how much training, how much equipment, how much time it's taken and how much dedication. Um, I have written blogs about um, you get the arts culture you pay for. At the moment, we've got Dairy Lee. I'd like Cave Age to Cheddar. Thank you very much. I would like um, a kind of creative revolution in terms of per perception from the audience that we had with food 10, 20 years ago. I mean, not everybody can go and buy artisan bread every day, but we're all glad that there are still artisan bakers who are making bread to traditional recipes. And enough of us are buying those loaves that those bakers can keep going and keep developing those products. Um, and I would like to see, you see what really got stripped out of the music business with all the sort of cut price music was that artisan class. The very, very popular Beyonce's and so on kept making music. The garage bands who earned nothing and played in clubs for free at, down at the local golf club, they kept going. What got stripped out was the people who weren't commercial but were who, the, who were the rainforest seedbed for all the big artists who were developing new art forms, who were a specialist taste, who were sourdough bread, that not everybody wanted, but that kept that culture going. And, you know, I really, really worry about the arts when that level of, of uh, artisan culture gets stripped away. Um, and I, don't, I can't give you, I mean, nobody, I think, can give you an answer to that arts-wide problem. But for your particular situation, if I were you, I'd go and hone in on who your contacts are, what your USP is, and what you can persuade people to pay you for. Give smart as well, and give big, and make sure it's noticed. Um, I don't know how much I can sort of talk about this without sounding like a complete Machiavellian sort of <laughs> double standard. But um, when, um, the Acton Community Forum asked me to go and paint a, a, a wall for them for their, um, their, their, their estate art projects. They offered me this wall and I said, well, what about the other 14 stories above it? And they sort of, well, don't see why not. And I actually ended up, I funded the whole project. I gave, I, I, I hired a lifter and I, I learned, I trained myself how to operate a lifter and I did the whole thing and I ended up spending a whole load of money doing that, but it then became the tallest mural in Britain. Um, when Homerton Hospital approached me after I'd done two other projects with the NHS, the first of which was actually a cheat. I didn't actually get hired by the NHS. I just painted something that looked like a bit like it might be on the NHS. But um, they hired me to do something at Homerton. They asked me to do something at Homerton for free. Um, I did a mural there, and I said, well, let's not just stop there. Let's do a print release as well. And let's not just do a print release. Let's do a print release in the hospital so we get a big queue of people to queue for the print release. And then let's not just do that. Let's make a documentary about it, and then, then let's not just do that, but then let's take the artist proofs and put them through Christie's auction, and then let's put that into a news article. And so then you get all that m money that c will keep your, um, the arts uh, foundation, the, the art um, rehabilitation unit there going. And then, ta da! <laughs> or you could just have a mural. So, I don't know how things work in the, um, the cycle photography world, but I think that finding some way where you can inextricably link yourself to a project so that you say, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Like if a magazine says, will you, will, you do a, a photo, will you come and photograph at this rally for us? You're like, yeah, but I want to be the on-site reporter. I want to 
I'm going to be on the masthead, I want a column, and I'd like to have, you know, I don't know, it, 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 how brave do you feel? Yeah, I want a monthly column. I want my name on the masthead of the magazine. Try your luck, push your luck. Push it till it breaks. <laughs> and then keep pushing. Hello. How are we doing for time, by the way? Just double check. Oh, it's eight now. It's eight. Is that okay? Yeah. Um. Hi. Um, I've got loads of questions. Hello. Um, oh, right. Okay. Where sorry, you? got two mics. Oh, sorry. Um, could, could you be after this gentleman? Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. Hello. Um, good evening. Um, just a question on the free work, actually. I had a scenario when I was photographing a jazz singer and um, I took it on board as an opportunity seeing the gold rather than the manure. So um, the thing is I get ac I've got access to her verbally and later I just sent her two images as a sort of thank you for the access from her management and so forth. And in reply, they said, we would love to use one of the images for a cover. And they wanted it cropped in a specific way, which I wasn't happy with. Um, so therefore, my reply was, I'm not happy with the crop, and it will cost you X amount. And I didn't hear back from them. And I know I'm going to hopefully be photographing her again. So what would your advice be on approaching that situation um, when that arises when I'm in that scenario verb you know face to face to try and get more work or whatever I think it depends on what level you are at in your career I mean we all hear the stories of diva who stamps her foot and asks for you know white lilies and white sofas and gets them that's not everyone you know that's not people at the beginning of their career unless they've got some big sort of major thing happening around them um, how mu I think the thing to weigh up is how much further would it take your work to have said yes to a crop you didn't like if you got a cover because if it had meant that then you could start charging the price you wanted because you were listed as the photographer who took that cover shot or it meant you could have access to a lot of other artists who might also use you for covers and you might get an exhibition of sort of artist portraits out of it, which some photographers do specialise in, and it, if it meant that you got into a whole new circle of influence there, I might have said compromise on the, on the crop. Um, and you know, one has to respect that other people are coming at it from a commercial point of view, and they do know something about what will sell to their market. You might not like it as a as a piece of art which you are putting your name to if it was blown up and mounted on the, on the wall there behind you. Um, but as a piece of cover artwork which will sell to that artist's fan base, it may be appropriate. So, you know, it's a question of, of looking at it from, from the point of view of what it will be used for as well, rather than as from a purely artistic, aesthetic uh, point of view. That, you know, those are the things I would, I would bear in mind another time. And you know, you're, it's great, you've got another run at it. When I, when I sang on, um, when Lord of the, the Lord of the Rings films first approached me to sing on the second film, The Two Towers, um, I asked for um, a deal that they never ever give, and they said no, and I said fine. <laughs> you know, and they went away. Uh, and then they came back three months later, with the soundtrack having to be finished within three weeks and said, uh, we'd really like you to do this, you know. And at this time I thought, okay, I think it's time to get a bit of legal advice here and see if I'm being a bit too bullheaded about it. And the advice I got was, yeah, uh, I wouldn't ask for that, but maybe ask for this and it will be just as good as in financial terms. So I did that, just put it in a different form and um, we got it done in the three weeks. So it's great that you're getting a second run at it. Um, so those are the things I'd consider. How does that sound? Yeah, yeah, it sounds good. Um, it was just basically on, this, on the next time she's coming down to the jazz club, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to be, you know, I don't wanna be treading on eggshells, mm -hmm. um, trying to approach her again and say, oh, look, you know, can I 
please photograph you again. Um, we've established a sort of uh, relationship from the first time, and I don't know how that relationship has changed since that, since I've not heard from her. So. She, she may not know about it, yeah. she may have forgotten about it. I mean, if she knows mm. you, then be friendly, and if she's a nice mm. person, hopefully you'll get past it. I mean, you had every right to say no. It was your work. I'm sure she understands that yeah. if she's a singer. Good luck. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Can we, do you mind if we go straight to the lady because we're running out of time? Yeah. Hi. Um, I've got loads of questions, but I'll choose two. So I wanted you to talk about um, a bit about procrastination mm -hmm. and um, also... I've been struggling with feelings of fe feeling on the back foot constantly lately with not getting enough done, not getting where I want to be. And I know it's, I've sort of acknowledged that it's a continuous journey and like life, you're never going to get it done. You're never going to finish. But I'd just like to hear your views on those two subjects really. Well, procrastination is a huge subject and it depends on where you're coming at procrastination from. You could be procrastinating because you are insufficiently prepared for the level you're trying to pitch to, your next artistic work to. You could be procrastinating because you're not delegating effectively um, and you're trying to do jobs which you'd be better off paying someone else to do with more contacts and more resources or who simply have, has the skills. Um, you could be procrastinating because you've got FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, if your social, I know I've known artists like this, you know, if your social life is more important than your art, then, you know, stop torturing yourself about it, you know, and, and scale back what you think you're going to achieve and acknowledge to yourself that your social life is more important or you, while your children are small, that's more important or while you're caring for a, a parent with a terminal illness, that's more important, you know, and you're, you can't spread yourself too thinly. I think the key is to um, is to is to work out whether expect whether you're expecting yourself to, to do in human hours, and uh, so whether you're kind of pushing yourself to be a workaholic and therefore you think you're procrastinating, or whether you're procrastinating because something within your structure is not right, something within your work-life balance is not right, something within your priorities is not right or something within your administration and strategy systems is not right. So it's very difficult, unless I knew you, to, to kind of talk about procrastination from your point of view, because it could be any of those areas. Um, what I will say is, if you do get a chance to look through the book, um, the strategy um, chapter might help you focus on why you're not feeling motivated to work, why, why you're kind of avoiding work, if that's the pattern, um, and how to know when you're expecting yourself to overwork. That's in chapter 10. So chapter 6 and chapter 10, I would say. Sometimes it can be because something like I find, sometimes I procrastinate about something, I procrastinate about a project. If there's something I'm not quite happy about, but I don't know what it is, and I just put it off and off and off and off and off. And then I find that asking, like firing a load of questions at whoever you're doing, whoever's, like sometimes if I felt like I put something off for ages and then I'll be like, hold on, you haven't got insurance or you haven't got a ladder or you haven't got anything. <laughs> I've kind of dreaded, I, a lot of times I've been, I've got a subconscious dread about something because I've not actually thought, I've not actually dug enough. And sometimes it needs a bit of digging to realise what is wrong with this? Why is this project not happening? Sometimes it's actually a very valid reason. Sometimes procrastination is actually something, it's your internal, like, yeah, it's good to like distinguish what, whether, it, it, sometimes procrastination is actually your instincts in disguise. Sometimes it's just procrastination, sometimes it's just gone lazy, but it's, um, sometimes it's, well, it's worth having a dig, because it could be something like not right with the project. But, uh, and creativity is hard work. I mean, I think the, the, 
everybody else is getting their attention span sliced into smaller and smaller pieces with social media and film editing and you know music videos and all that and the key to being to creating great work is being able to sit at that coal face of possibilities which is a very uncomfortable place and tolerate the feeling of having nothing and the feeling that it could be anything and you don't know what it is yet and people saying what is it what is it have you got it have you got it yet no and you're just sitting there day after day developing the mental and emotional muscles to do that is part of what will make you a good creator and it's something that even school children are losing you know people that's not emphasized enough people who are who say oh i'm terrible at math quite often it's that they haven't sat with the discomfort of not being able to work on the problem they want to do the subjects that are easy that they, they know they have talent with and they can kind of run with, which is great. But that, for life, as well as for art, being able to sit with the discomfort of that is, mm. is important. And you do, it is a muscle. You do need to build it up. A, a lot of the time I've dreaded taking on big projects because I don't, I know deep down, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't have the infrastructure to deal with it. It's just like, oh God, it's like, it feels like a big stodgy meal that you've got to go, you work your way through. But um, what I learned through um, talking with Sheila a lot is like how to like get get the infrastructure there beforehand. Um, a lot of what the book's about is about building this infrastructure. And when you when like right early on in my career, she was like, "You have to have this folder with all these." spaces in the folder for like 20 different projects I'm like, i don't have 20 different projects i'm just struggling to get one but now i'm so grateful that i've got all these different like suspension files and drop down files in my computer so i can be like i've got 20 different things happening at the same time moving things on bit by bit sometimes when you're overwhelmed it can just that thought of taking on another project is just like oh and booking in this the thing that i haven't mastered the chapter i haven't mastered yet is taking a break um, I just, I don't want to jinx it, but you know, I might be taking a break at some point. <laughs> but um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes you just need a break as well. Sometimes it's just all too much, you just need to take a break. And then come back to it with fresh eyes. Thank you. Well, we have a, I, I don't want to keep anyone, if you do have to leave, just, um, you know, um, unfortunately we haven't got to the signing yet, but I, I would like to keep answering, is that okay with everyone to keep answering questions or? Yeah, this gentleman was first, and then this lady. Do excuse me with the jelly babies, but it does help with the, with the mouth. <laughs> hey, my name's Nand. Um, so the book is focused for like the artist to read and stuff like that. Is there anything in there for like the people around the artist to read? Um, um, like it could be like whether it's. I don't know whether, well, it's not a partner, I'm single. Uh, it's my mum and dad, basically. <laughs> um, is there anything that, like, they're so supportive, they're so supportive, but they just don't get it, you know? <laughs> they just don't get it. And I'm, I would love for there to be a book hint um, for about the people, like the artists, to give to the close ones around them, because... <laughs> I, I did write a book for singers which didn't get published, and I think for good reason it wasn't quite right. Uh, but every chapter included notes for the people around the singer. Um, what is your art form? Actor. And what don't your parents get? They just don't, like, they're so supportive, but say like, I'm just trying, like, this, today for example, this is the reason why I'm saying it today, so I had a, a film that was doing great, and it's going to be screened at Soho House, and mm. they asked me to do a Q&A for it, and I was like, Mom, so has asked me to do a Q&A and the first thing was like, so how much are you getting paid then? And I was like, yeah. no, you, like you don't get it. <laughs> like, yeah. that, that's, it's, I think they're it, so supportive, but it, they don't get okay, it. Okay, I think it's a problem of them not understanding the right business models. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the music business and I entered the music business at the age of 14. And so the financial models I learned were those of the music business. For instance, effectively a record company is a bank that loans you the money to make a record. It may be, I mean, at the time it was like 60,000 pounds, which was you know, enough for four houses. Um, 
uh, or small houses anyway, um, and they don't charge you interest, and they don't, if, you, if the sales don't ever recoup, they don't ever come and collect the rest of the loan. Fast forward to when I'm 20, I'm considering getting a loan from a bank. Couldn't believe they were going to ask for the first payment the month after I've got the money. Couldn't believe that they were going to charge interest because it was just a completely separate financial system with completely different um, criteria. If you can translate what you're doing into, I mean, do your do your mum and dad understand anything about business at so all? So I'm the first creative. I mean, I'm Indian, so everyone else is business and medicine. <laughs> uh, and I'm the first creative out of that. So they support it. They just don't. Do, do they have they run a business themselves? Yeah, or? yeah, for sure. Okay, so I mean, if you explain the, the Q and A in terms of uh, promotion, yeah. advertising, so you're doing it for free, but it's like you're you're um, being interviewed in the paper for free, but it means you get promotion. Right. So it might help if you can translate it into terms that they would understand from conventional business, and it might help if you told them that it, it's um, it's an industry that where your prices go up depending on how much promotion you get because you know a can of beans is 36p or however much it is or 80p or whatever um, you can get as much promotion for your corner shop as, as you like but the price of beans is still going to be 80p they don't understand that the price of that can of beans is going to go up and once they get that then they may be more sympathetic thank you yeah, I appreciate, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I can't believe you use the corner shop analogy, Sheila. <laughs> Hi. First of all, I wanted to thank both of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come speak with us tonight. It's been very uh, insightful. Um, my question is, how do you sustain creativity, um, particularly as old sources of inspiration die and your art form changes over time, what would you say are some of some things that you can do to continue to sustain that? I find it's really important to, and, and this is not going to be a popular answer with all the business side of things, it's really important to, while you're working well, go towards the thing that makes your creative heart sing. So there will be times, oh these sirens are dreadful. Yes, the business police wanting you to make commercial work. Um, um, it's really important to do stuff that makes your heart sing creatively. And that may mean making the odd project that is very, very uncommercial. Because that exploration is going to develop your muscles as an artist. So, um, you know, Monsoon, you're all too young to remember this, but Monsoon had this top 10 hit, Asian Fusion hit in 1982, and then we did this album. And although it wasn't a hit, it, it, it sold quite well. And forever after, because Monsoon had kind of... Monsoon was in the charts in 1982. The whole world music thing as a, as a genre didn't really get going until 1987. And a lot of the people who started those world music labels were inspired by Monsoon. So every time I went to a world music label, they would be like, oh, can, we, can you get Monsoon back together? You know. And I was like, I can't tell you how many marketing meetings I've sat in, in major record companies, where they're going, you know, it'd be great if you could really get Monsoon back together. <laughs> okay, right, it's only the 20th time I heard that today. But, and they did not, then I started making, oh my God, solo voice and drone albums. I'm talking about one voice, one drone, that's it, for the whole album, oh my God. These are people working generally in the pop arena, marketing all sorts of mainstream artists and suddenly they've got this mad woman in front of them who's making these out not just one three of them three and but you know what that was the best work of my life i could have kept going with that it pulled me to such a high level of technique as a singer um so it's not going to be popular but if you keep making pop boilers if you keep making 
uh, commercial work that pleases everybody else, you will lose your creative path because you're not listening to that little voice inside you saying, uh, this is what I'm interested in. Yeah, but nobody's interested in that. Yeah, but that's what I'm interested in. Well, no, nobody's making music like that. But yeah, but that's what interests me. That's the direction you have to go in in the long term. And you can maybe get away with a couple of pop boilers, but make no mistake, every single project you see through to fruition will influence every other project for the rest of your creative career. So don't make too many pop boilers. Because you don't want too many cul-de-sacs in your creative thinking. You've got to get used to listening to that little voice because it knows much better than you. Much better than you. It, it's very, it, it's really important. Ooh. It's important to recognize that um, sometimes artists and musicians will say, you know, never compromise on your music. And they'll say, yeah, if a record company, if they offer you something, you don't want it, just say no, I want it like this. And it's like, yeah, if you're Van Halen, you can say, I want, don't want to do it like that or whatever. Like, but if, like, I, I, I always got annoyed with that because it's like, yeah, if I say no, if I if I'd said no to galleries, if I said no, I want to do this like this, and or if I want to do a show with a concept that's like this to a gallery who were doing who weren't interested in that sort of art, I'd, they just go on to the next artist. And so there is a lot of compromise. You can't just stamp your foot at that level. But if you, yeah, there is compromise, but it's up to you how to creative like. Can I, can I come in on that, though? Yeah. Because the thing you do, did was make yourself independent of galleries. Yeah. Which meant you could paint what you wanted. Yeah, it's... And if you're willing to do that work, and if you're willing to find a, a way, and you're willing to probably earn less than you could if you were cashing in on the most commercial path, then it is possible. But, you know, you'll be creating work as long as you live because of that, because you're not, you're not, you're not creating greetings cards. You're not doing logos. I, I did... I compromised... I, I make the art that I want to make now. Um, I've in in Sheila's she Sheila's structure really helped protect my artistic integrity. It gave me the structure. It sort of like made this little world where I could be free and create what I want. It looks after my immediate needs and um, my my. What am I trying to say? Yeah, you're going to have to compromise a certain amount, but it's up to you to like make sure that you're compromising in the right places. Maybe, but I, I did a lot of family portraits, and I, I don't do family portraits anymore. I don't paint. I'm not going to paint the dog of the family. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I mean, that was lovely for a while, but um, and that that helped me to establish, you know, that making those sort of compromises and being able to get that sort of my studio turnover happening so that I now have my studio and I choose I choose what I paint now and uh, and, and clients may select uh, something they like and I get to and I'm I I approach I I get to choose what I want to do most of the time but then there are still times when I sort of have to go I have to choose whether or not I'm going to do a project based on how much I'm going to compromise um, compromise is definitely part of it. It's just how you're going to compromise. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, on that inspiring note, I'm afraid we are going to have to call Len to the Q&A, um, just because I'm thinking of time. We've got until 9 o'clock, and then lights will going to turn off. So um, I'd like to thank Stick and Sheila for coming along this evening. <laughs>